Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our worship gathering at Parkside Bible Church. My name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here. We're so glad you've joined us. You know, I don't know if you're uh, experiencing the same thing I am today or not, but just about the time I started to get used to it, to a weekly rhythm coming out of the pandemic, last week we hit a holiday week and it just kind of spins the whole thing up again and it, it throws off the weekly rhythm. And, and as we gather today, we try to anchor ourselves. I want to encourage you to find an anchor for your soul in the God that we are coming to worship. So I, I call you and I, I encourage you to, to leave last week behind. Leave this morning behind. Leave this afternoon in the future and dig deep on who this God is. And to help us do that, let me, let me just read a passage from Exodus chapter 6. We read, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. This is the Lord, the God, the Deliverer that we come to worship this morning. So join your hearts together with mine in prayer before we enter into a time of singing. God in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the breath that you have given to us. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come and worship at your feet clear our, our minds from distractions and we ask that you would take the burdens off of our shoulders and uh, enable us to see you clearly this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth we pray these things in jesus name amen i invite you to join in singing uh, some songs together Good morning church family let's sing together <clears throat>
is polite for a guy that just is satisfied with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior. We do have a perfect high priest who is there to plead on our behalf, to proclaim the, his own finished work. As our service transitions from Creator God into the, the fall of man, friends, this week our hearts are heavy and they are grieved as we've seen the, the effects of the fall manifest themselves through racism all across our nation, particularly in the events in Minneapolis. We lament the sinfulness, the wicked acts that have taken place. Friends, I, I encourage you, Romans 12 speaks of the marks of a true Christian. And it says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. In our social media age, we're, we're sort of tempted to, to render a judgment on motives for this or motives for that or outcome for that. And I just want to urge you to stop. Stop assigning blame, judging motives here or there, and just weep with those who weep this morning. Weep with our, our black and brown brothers and sisters who are weeping Weep with our law enforcement who sees injustice being done. And they don't stand for that either. Just stop and weep with those who weep. So as we enter into a time of prayer, confessing sins before God, join your hearts with mine as we pray together. God, we, we look around. And we see the image of God, your very image, stamped on the hearts of every human being. And we, we're brought to tears when we see one image bearer destroying another. God, it breaks our hearts to see that image being defamed. God, we pray that you would grant forgiveness to those who have committed these wrongs. Grant repentance from the sin of racism in this country. God, we pray that you would bring, bring those who are guilty to justice. God, we ask for, for those that are in, in law enforcement and in civic authority and all those who are rendering judgments, that you would give them great wisdom, great discernment, great understanding. And God, for those that hurt this morning, may we have the grace to stop and lament with them. To take our pain and our hurt to you and to empathize with those who feel that hurt. With those who have been wronged. God, give us understanding and a gracious heart, not one that is self-justifying or one that wants to point out the flaws in another. Help us to see our very own neediness before you before we try to stand as the judge of another. God, as we, as we begin to turn our attention towards the scriptures, we ask, we ask that you would aim for our hearts. Give us a soft and a sensitive heart to hear your word, to be shaped and changed and transformed by it. And may we have the grace to repent of our sins, to run to you, and find mercy at the foot of the cross. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Parkside family. And for those of you who are joining us, my name is Eddie Ferguson. I have the privilege to serve here as one of the pastors at Parkside. And before we get started in God's Word here this morning, I want to take uh, just a quick moment to share a few announcements. Uh, first of all, 
I hope that this uh, video recording of our services has been a blessing to you. Uh, I know some of you were kind of curious last week when we had in-person services why you weren't seeing a video feed from our auditorium. Uh, to put it short, we uh, do not have the capabilities to live stream out of our service, out of our auditorium. We've actually have been doing it in a separate classroom with just iPhones. And the phone is really close to me right now, and that would not be ideal for uh, preaching in front of uh, a congregation. Praise the Lord, though. We have received a grant from Center for the Congregations here in Indiana to help us fund the purchase of some equipment to begin live streaming. It'll cover about 90% of our costs, so we're really excited for that. And we, uh, we've we made that order, we're just waiting for everything to come in. So you can imagine we're not the only church who is purchasing equipment like that, so we're waiting for it to come in. And we hope in the next few weeks that we will begin to transition from this recording here to you being able to watch a live stream out of our auditorium and we hope that that's a real blessing to you and you can if you don't feel comfortable coming in person yet that you'll be able to join with those who are in person so look forward to that i have a second announcement uh, one of our core values here at parkside is to serve our community we want to be a blessing to our community and one of the key ways we do that is through our storehouse that is our clothes and food pantry that serves Brownsburg and the greater west side of Indianapolis. I'm going to encourage you to hop on the hub. We have a sign up because there are several needs in the storehouse this summer. We need people to come and staff it on Wednesday nights. We need people who come throughout the week and just help us sort and hang up clothes. We also, throughout the summer, do what's called the Summer Cafe, where I invite you to provide food, uh, cook it, we've got a grill out there and everything, and then to serve it to those who come and just sit and talk. It's truly one of the greatest impacts and opportunities we have as a church family to serve our community. If you've never done anything in the storehouse, I encourage you this summer, get out and do that. You can hop on the hub, sign up in one of those opportunities. Really encourage you to do that. Also, our Sunday school classes are beginning to resume their giving of food. So if you could help us with that, we want to increase those stockpiles as we anticipate this summer uh, having more needs to, to help people out. Let me pray for us as we turn to God's word now. <clears throat> God, I come and ask that you would forgive me of my sins, that you would use me in this time to speak to your people. There are many things from your word that you have laid and pressed heavy on my heart. And I ask that you would give me the breath to speak those words to your people now. May they see the redemption they can find in our Savior, Jesus. Help us now, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Last week, Pastor Chris shared with us from Exodus chapter 2 how God was with Moses, and he used circumstances to prepare him to liberate the people of Israel. Now, the very next chapter... God comes to Moses in a burning bush and tells him, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cries. It is there at the burning bush that God names himself, I am. No qualifiers needed, no credentials necessary, just simply, I am. He says, I am here. I am listening. I am with you. Before we launched into our summer series, we wanted to take these two Sundays to remind you that I am is with you. And the historical narratives of the Old Testament provide a, a unique way of reminding us all of that. The story continues past the burning bush as Moses leads the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and God uses their journey to form them into his people and he reintroduces himself to them. 
Now, throughout the journey, a pattern emerges. God gives, and the people wander off. Food is given, and the people complain. The law is brought down from the mountain, and the people turn to a golden calf. God provides his people a promised land, and then the people doubt whether he is able to give it to them. Nevertheless, God has made them his people, and he has provided them a way of life and a place to live it. Now, over the past several months, our Sunday school classes have been studying in the book of Judges, uh, a book that really perfectly demonstrates this pattern of behavior that was established all the way back at the Exodus. In the book of Judges, we learn that even um, though his people continually run away from him, God is still present and God is still at work. Right? God is faithful in the midst of human failure. This morning, we come to the book of Ruth, an historical account of something that took place during this time of the judges. It took place in a town you may have heard of, Bethlehem. But the story doesn't start there. In fact, the story starts in another country called Moab. Moab is on the other side of the Dead Sea from Judah. You can see here on this map. Now, Moab was considered to be one of the fiercest enemies of God's people. The story starts here because a famine had come to the area of Judah, and a man by the name of Elimelech had followed the pattern of behavior we have seen repeated by the Israelites. Instead of trusting in God, he takes matters into his own hands and moves his family to a foreign land. Now, at this moment, you may expect the story of the book of Ruth to kind of unfold in a similar way to the book of, Jude, to the book of Judges. And you prepare yourself for some kind of wild tale. Or you may have some familiarity with the Bible and you have thought of Ruth as a tale of epic romance, a love story for the ages that rivals Romeo and Juliet, and, and you long for your Boaz to give you a rose. Now, fortunately, that's not the story that we find here in the Bible. Neither of those. In fact, the, the, the title is a little deceiving we actually see and hear very little of Ruth compared to the others. This is actually Naomi's story, the wife of Elimelech, and more specifically, a story of God's redemptive plan for her. The story begins and ends with Naomi and what happens to her. The story begins with tragic news that she has lost her husband, widowed in a foreign land. And she is now faced with finishing the raising of their two sons on her own in a country that is not her own. This story is a widow's story, a widow's journey to have blessings and not bitterness. I, I, I can only begin to imagine the emotions Naomi would have faced when learning of that tragic news of losing her spouse. However, there are several in our church who know that reality all too well. Our church family here at Parkside is, is, is privileged to have several who have walked through becoming a widow or a widower. And they have done so with, with grace and honesty in such a way that has taught me and all of us so much about who God is. 
I reached out to a few widows and widowers in our church family and asked them if they would share their journey with me. And as we walk through Naomi's journey this morning, I would like to provide insights and thoughts from a few in our own congregation who have faced a similar path. It was incredibly kind and courageous of them to share their story so openly with me. So out of respect, I will share them anonymously. But I hope that hearing their story with Naomi's will help us see how the presence of God is with us during incredibly hard times. He is at work during those times for his glory and our good. We do not know how Naomi's husband died, but only that she was left with her two sons. She was able to finish raising her boys on her own, which proves she had to have been a, a pretty strong woman, and to see them married off to local Moabite women only then for the sons to die as well. Here sits Naomi in a foreign country, widowed, having just lost her two sons. When I asked those who have faced the loss of their spouse, they, they described it this way. Initially, shock. I couldn't think straight didn't really feel anything I can express. Another shared, I felt like part of me was had been ripped away. The most important person to me on this earth was just gone. I was in shock and somewhat paralyzed. I lost confidence and felt very vulnerable. Naomi, not knowing what to do next, went to the only place that she knew, home. She had heard that the fields in Bethlehem were bearing harvest, and so she decided to return. Her daughter-in-laws, young widows themselves, feel an obligation to her because they're, they're all she has. Naomi releases them, tells them, no, go back to your own families. That's the only way you will find a husband. Go back to those families. Maybe they will help you find someone and, and, and you'll have, get married and have kids and have a full life. Go, go back. And one follows her mother-in-law's instructions, but another does not. Ruth decides to stay with Naomi. She decides to journey with her to Bethlehem. She says in Ruth 1, 16 through 8, Do not urge me to leave you or, or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. And now our story is of two widows. Two vulnerable widows with nothing to their name and no one to take care of them except God. They begin to make that dangerous trek from Moab to Bethlehem, which was a several days journey on foot over mountains and through rivers. And finally, Naomi returns to Bethlehem with Ruth by her side. They return at the beginning of barley harvest, which would have been about the, the mid to late April time, just as the rainy season is ending. And Bethlehem was, was bustling with motion. You see, the harvest requires that everyone in the family help out. This is a lot like that first spring Saturday of good weather here in Indiana. You know what I'm talking about, where the skies are clear, it's warm, and everybody rushes to Lowe's, and we buy tons of mulch and plants, and everybody has a job, right? We're weeding, we're planting, we're mulching, we're de-winterizing. 
the house is just full of commotion as every family member has their job and they're moving about. Naomi and Ruth walk into Bethlehem during all of this commotion and a few ladies recognize Naomi. Now, it, it's been a few years, so maybe Naomi has changed her haircut a little bit or, or just the tragedy of loss has deepened the wrinkles on her face. So they come to her and they say, is that you, Naomi? And Naomi responds in Ruth 1, 20 through 21, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Naomi struggles to not see the bitterness and questions, what is God up to? Why has he allowed her to walk such a difficult path? Several widows shared with me that they asked God why, but remembered that it's okay to ask God that question as long as we look to him for the answer. Naomi knew her struggle was with God and she pushed into him for the answer. Exhausted from the journey and probably even more exhausted just from the, the weight of loss, Naomi and Ruth find a place to sleep and they begin to think about their life in a new town. In speaking with our church's widows and widowers, they, they shared the, the difficulty of making decisions alone. Having made decisions together for years, they are now left alone. Out of all those who shared with me, every one of them brought up loneliness. They shared how alone they felt. And one shared that the hardest part was the loneliness, especially at night, not having my best friend to share my thoughts with growing old alone. I can imagine Naomi, her first night there in Bethlehem, lying alone in bed, just wishing her husband was laying next to her. And her mind begins to race, trying to figure out finances, trying to figure out ways to help her and Ruth just get by and just all the decisions that needed to be made. And suddenly she remembers. She remembers God's provision in the law. The, the extra provision, that extra harvest should be left for those in need. And the next morning she sends out Ruth to go pick up some of the extra barley harvest. You see, God had long ago made provisions for the poor and refugees, who Naomi and Ruth were both. And in Leviticus 19, 9 through 10, he commanded, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to the edge. It's neither, you sh neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyards bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them there for the poor and for the sojourn. I am the Lord your God. The provisions of the law allowing people to glean extra food were a part of God's plan for how it's best to live life. What's interesting is that this plan, the way of life, the law, is what the people of Israel had continually resisted and pushed back against. They questioned whether his way is the best way. And here in Ruth, we, we get just a small little glimpse as to why it is the best way. It is best because he is the creator of life. We see that his plan is to make provisions for people when they are facing the difficulties of life in a sinful world. 
Now, Ruth, she was nervous. She was nervous to go out and gather barley from the fields. Certainly, Naomi had heard word about how unruly and defiant people had become during this time. You see, it was common for women to be abused or taken advantage of while trying to pick up that extra harvest. However, Ruth discovered a different scene when she came to a field owned by a man named Boaz. Boaz came out to greet her and all those who had come to collect that day. Ruth 2.4 tells us his words. He says, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. See, Boaz was still maintaining that common greeting in the Lord. And Ruth catches Boaz's eye. And Boaz says to his right-hand man, whose young woman is this? Now, let me say that just a little differently. Let me say that how I think Boaz said it, his inflection there. I think he said it more like, whose young woman is this, right? This moment reminds me so much of when I first met my wife, Sarah. When I came on staff here at the church, I was single, and she was in the Sunday school class that I was teaching. And she could answer my questions about the Bible better than I could. So I went to John Mulligan, who many of you know, and, and asked him, who is this beautiful young woman in my class? Now, John said, oh, man, Eddie, she's way out of your league. Don't even try. But it's okay. We ended up having him officiate our wedding, so it came full circle. Now, much like Boaz when he saw Ruth, when I saw Sarah, I saw something that stood out that was different than anyone else. And I imagine Boaz saw a woman carrying a heavy burden of life, but that had strength and boldness. A woman who chapter one tells us was trusting in the Lord. Boaz had Ruth stay only at his field to protect her and to get to know her. You know how it is when you're trying to woo someone, right? You invent all of these different reasons that you need to see them or talk to them just so you can get more time with them, so you can get to know them. This is what Boaz does. And Ruth continues to work in his fields to provide for her and Naomi. He even asks her to have lunch with him. So there they are, sitting at the edge of the field together, maybe eating their PB&J sandwiches, when Boaz shares how impressed that he is that Ruth, a Moabite, has stayed and cared for Naomi, a relative of his. Boaz says to her, The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given by the Lord the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. After that first day of work, Ruth goes home to Naomi, and Naomi begins to ask questions about her day the way only a mother can ask questions. Right? You know what I'm talking about. Your mom asks you questions you just know she already knows the answer to. Naomi asks, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice on you. And I, I imagine one of the ladies in town is walking by the field and sees Boaz and Ruth sitting there eating, talking, and immediately she goes running to Naomi. You're never going to believe who Ruth was eating with today. And with excitement shares the story. Boaz, uh, of, of the story of, of meeting Boaz. And in fact, I, she tells, Naomi tells Ruth of a Jewish custom she wasn't familiar with that was laid out in the law. She tells her that this man, Boaz, is a close relative of ours. 
one of our redeemers. You see there are provisions, plans, and promises for redemption built into the Levitical law. Redeemer is mentioned 20 times just here in the book of Ruth. And the idea of a kinsman, a relative, redeemer, is central to the book. Leviticus 25, 25 and Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, they all lay out the ways in which a relative can come to the aid of poor and destitute relatives to help them, to redeem them out of poverty. Remembering this promise and knowing that only a relative can claim her late husband's land there in Bethlehem, Naomi knew that Boaz was their hope for redemption and refuge. You see, in, in this time, women had very little rights and certainly no right to property, even though it was her late husband's. Property would just sit until a worthy relative, a kinsman, would redeem it before the elders in the town. I'm sure the wheels are just kind of turning in Naomi's head after Ruth had worked for some time in Boaz's field. And she encourages her daughter-in-law to make known to Boaz his ability to redeem their family's property, and if he wanted to, marry Ruth to provide for these two widows. It's, it's a tricky proposal to make. Right? Boaz may reject her, or a closer relative who isn't kind may come in to claim his right instead. But Ruth goes and shares with Boaz his opportunity for redemption. Upon realizing this opportunity for kinsman redemption, Boaz jumps into action. He calls for a meeting before the elders at the city gate. And to make sure everything is above board, he gives the one relative who is closer in relation the chance to step up and claim. When that man does not, he declares his intentions and makes a request to the elders to enact this law of kinsman redemption. Boaz went out of the city gates to fulfill the law to buy back his kinsmen to redeem them. What is interesting is that there is no indication in the law that kinsman redemption had to include marriage. Boaz goes above and beyond in his redemption. Right? The story of redemption by Boaz really shows us a beautiful picture of complete and total restoration that returns all that had been taken away plus the inheritance of a redeemer. The buyback and deliverance of Ruth and Naomi through Boaz is complete and thorough. Boaz marries Ruth and provides refuge. And he restores Naomi. God blesses this new family with a little baby boy. And they named him Obed. And when the women of the town maybe saw a picture of little Obed on Facebook come running to greet Naomi, and they say that they've heard the news. And they say to her in Ruth 4.14, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. The journey comes full circle. Naomi sees the blessings of the Lord and does not allow bitterness to take root. The book of Ruth concludes with an interesting little note. Right? The book was probably written during the time of the exile, several hundred years after these events took place. And God directed the author to include a very important note in Ruth 4.17. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Do you see the family connection? Look here at this family tree. It'll help you draw the connection. 
Naomi, a widow left in a foreign land, becomes the great-great-grandmother of Israel's greatest king. Ruth, a foreigner, becomes the great-grandmother of David. Furthermore, since the author concludes with the linkage to David's lineage, this meaning contends that God's redemptive plan in the life of David with the promise of a Messiah, Jesus, connects to this story. Naomi had no idea that her burdens and bitterness would turn around to blessings and benefits for the whole world. A new family with a blessing in the lineage of the promised Messiah. Naomi's story is a widow's journey from bitterness to blessing. And she had no idea that she was holding the grandfather of Israel's greatest king, the one from whom the Messiah would come, the kinsman redeemer of the world. Can you see the scene in your mind's eye? I know how excited my mom was to hold my son for the first time. So I can only imagine Naomi standing there holding her grandson for the first time. I can see her looking out on the hills outside of Bethlehem, hills that a millennia later would host angels heralding the arrival of Jesus. Standing there with her grandson in her arms, she looks down at him, her first. She looks down into his eyes, but having no idea that she was looking into similar eyes of the Savior who would come. I can imagine genes passed down by generations, maybe keeping little flecks of brown in those eyes that would one day fill with tears as he hung on the cross, looking down on the sinful world he was paying for the eyes of a kinsman redeemer, bringing his children back to their creator for refuge and restoration. As Naomi sat there holding little Obed, I'm sure she would have loved to have shared that moment with her husband. But now, she understands that God used the taking of her husband to bring her to this moment. She didn't feel the presence of her husband, but she felt the presence of God, her creator. What we have learned from Naomi is that we feel the presence of God in his provisions, in his plans, and in his promises. All throughout the story, we feel that sovereign hand of God guiding the events along. One of our widows shared with me, God is sovereign, yet always good. He is there. The more you are struggling, the more you need to dig and get others to help you dig to know him and his true nature better. Many times it seems we think God should do this or that, but God's way is better, and we might never know why. He is sweeter than all this world can offer, for sure. You may be listening to me here this morning, and you haven't felt the grief of loss like these widows but you are hurting the hardships of life are crushing down on you right now and you may be asking god why why am i going through this this morning i share the story of naomi to persuade you to seek god and see him for that answer he will answer. 
maybe in a, a different timeline than you would like, but he does see what you are going through and he does hear your cries. I am is with you. And he is at work to bring you to refuge. Refuge in himself, under his wing. Let me encourage you to, to feel the presence of God in your life. One widower shared, God walks with us through times of trouble. We are never truly alone. His comfort, his strength, his direction in our lives remains there. And in faith, we are to follow him. Do you, do you understand do you understand this? We feel, feel the presence of God. We feel it in his provisions. We feel that hand of his presence in his plan. We feel his presence in his promises. Let me, let me help you think through this in light of Naomi's story and, and quickly look at how we can feel the presence of God during incredible hardship so that you know he is at work during those times. He's at work for his glory and for your good. I want to interject a few lessons our church's widows and widowers have learned. First, look at his provisions, right? God is good. He is kind. Just like the extra barley at the edge of the field, God leaves provisions for all those who trust in him. If you look to God in your time of distress, you will see his provisions literally laying there on the side of the road. One widow shared with me, she said, I could give you examples of times when I was at my lowest point and a card would come in the mail, or a friend would call and ask me to go somewhere. Another shared, he is faithful to me personally. He is faithful to his character and faithful to his word. He never leaves me or forsakes me. We are never alone. Though my heart aches, he is enough. Whatever you are facing, be it loneliness, sickness, or loss, look for God's provisions. God has laid them out there for you. And instead of looking out with bitterness on your situation, look for the provisions he has provided. I, I promise you, you will find them. Secondly, follow his plan. What is interesting is that the disobedience to God's plan by her husband is what took Naomi to a foreign land. But it was her trust and obedience in God's plan that led her to restoration. Naomi's trust in God was visible enough for Ruth to see it and want to follow her God instead of the false gods of Moab. Did you see in the story how at two key moments, Naomi follows God's plan laid out in the law? And she directs Ruth to collect the extra barley and then to seek a kinsman redeemer in Boaz. These are the two that are mentioned, but I can imagine that there were smaller moments along the way. God's word, the Bible, has laid out God's plan for our lives, a plan to know him and to be like him by the righteousness of Jesus. Scripture really does contain everything containing to life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus. You know what I found very interesting as I spoke with the uh, different widows and widowers in our church? Every single one of them shared about how their dependence on the word of God was what sustained them. Every one of them. One shared, he is my rock. Continually reminding myself of the truth of God's word is what helps me face each day. Another said that they learned God is so much more. 
He is a quiet presence, always whispering his direction, conviction, love, and anything else I need, whether I ask or not. I have learned to pay closer attention to the Lord through the day and in difficult moments. As you face hardship and wonder what is God's plan through it, pray and look to his word for answers. A widower shared with me that he has learned to pray and listen for the answer. He said, I, I have received answers in so many ways, but it is the be still, be quiet, listen, that seems to be heightened. The distress of life can be loud and at times just a cacophony of chaos. Take a breath, get alone, look to God's word. Don't follow your anxiety or your fear. Follow his plan, follow his word. So often we want to come up with our own plans and follow those. A famine hits and we run off to a foreign country just like Elimelech. As you walk through life's difficulties, feel the presence of God by looking for his provisions, by following his plan. And lastly, remember his promises. So many promises of redemption come to bear here in this story. Boaz finds territory and companionship, Ruth, restoration and hope, Naomi, refuge and a future. And we find the preparations to fulfill the promise of the Messiah. This side of the cross, we know that Jesus represents a far greater kinsman redeemer than Boaz. Maybe, just maybe, God has allowed you into a time of difficulty because it's the only way you will remember him. Maybe it's the only way you will feel his presence by stripping everything else away so you can remember his promises. Right? We are seeing this now in a time of pandemic. We can't turn to, to work or sports or eating out, theme parks, TV shows, or, or just hanging out with friends. All of those come up short and run out. God and his promises, they will endure. We were the ones who walked away from God. We chose sin, but, but from the very beginning, God promised a redeemer. Genesis 3, right after Adam and Eve sinned, God promised that one would come to crush sin for us. And the Old Testament helps us see the, the intricate way in which God fulfills his promise. The New Testament opens in Matthew with the retelling of the genealogy we find right here at the end of Ruth. And just as Ruth went to Boaz, all we have to do is go to Jesus. Turn to him. Trust in him as the redeemer of our sins. He was hung outside the city gates to fulfill the law, to buy us back to himself. The good news of Jesus is that we are not left alone. We do not have to deal with the lonely consequences of sin. Jesus stepped up and he paid the price that we should have, fulfilling the promise that God made. Remember his promises by clinging to Jesus in your time of distress. Maybe you have known Jesus as your Redeemer, and this morning you need to remember to look to Him instead of your own plan. You need to remember to look for the provisions of Jesus and not bitterness. 
So the rest of you, you don't know what I mean when I speak of knowing Jesus as your Redeemer. You are still widowed in a foreign country of your own sin. Your, your heart is heavy and alone in the treacherous terrain of this world. Turn to the promise of redemption. Turn to Jesus. Trust in Jesus and nothing else to save you from your sins. He is the only kinsman worthy enough to buy you back to a relationship with your creator. All the provisions of this world will not fulfill you. No plan that you come up with will give you the purpose your soul longs for. Only the promised Redeemer, Jesus Christ, can take your sin and give you life. The promised hope of Jesus is the only thing that will redeem us from the distress of sin. Don't wait for the presence of someone or something else of this world. Feel the presence of God. Naomi's story shows us the presence of God is with us during the incredible hardship, and he is at work to bring us back to himself, to bring us under his wing to take refuge, refuge from sin. One widow shared, I have learned that God always keeps his promises, that I am stronger with him than I ever thought I could be, and that I long more for his return than ever before. Feel the presence of God by looking for his provisions, following his plan, and remembering his promises. We're going to take a moment of silence now, and I want you to think through this. We're going to leave up on the screen this idea of his provisions, his plan, and his promises. And I want you to ask God to guide you through that, and see where you need to look, where do you need to follow, and where do you remember. God, we thank you for this story of Naomi, for her redemption. We thank you for providing our kinsman redeemer, Jesus. And I pray for those who have not yet found redemption in him. May this be the moment of their redemption. Thank you, Pastor Eddie, for that message from the Word of God. And friends, let me just offer one final encouragement from 2 Corinthians 5 before we move to a time of singing. First, speaking to those who, who may not know Christ yet. You've been listening. You've been, you've been hearing Pastor Eddie share from God's Word. And you say, as Pastor Eddie said, I, I don't know Jesus as this Redeemer. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Friend, Jesus will make you new from the inside out. That is a wonderful promise that he has laid out. Maybe that's the promise you need to latch on to this morning simply by repenting of your sin, turning instead of chasing your sin and following Jesus. And placing your faith in Jesus' death on the cross to forgive you of your sins. Repentance and faith is all that's required. Friend, maybe you have already done that. And God is bringing someone to mind this morning. 
who has not known Jesus as Redeemer. And God is impressing them on your heart, saying, reach out to them. I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. We continue in verse 18. It says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Friend, you've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Who are you taking this message to? It is why God has saved you, that you would proclaim his excellencies. Dwell on these things. Think deeply on them. Let this truth sink into your heart and to your soul. As we sing together now, may the Spirit of God continue to transform us.
Amen. Thank you, John and Emma, for leading us. Friends, what, a, what an opportunity we have this morning to remember our great God. For benediction, let me read 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 15. He who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortal, immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Church, amen. What a God we serve. As we close, we join your voices with mine for our closing commissioning. May we delight in the gospel, grow through relationships, serve our community, and be sent into the world. The church said, amen. amen. Let's, Let's do it. it. Thanks. You are dismissed.